we've determined that there are four phases of human-caused disaster. The first, unlike in a natural disaster, is an event that happens without any preparation. We describe that as impact or devastation. Suddenly, without any hint, a shooter walks into a congregation and attacks an organist or a pastor or a parishioner. Suddenly, without knowledge, your cell phone beeps and you find out there's been a mass shooting at the elementary school down the road and you know that there are children of the congregation and teachers from the congregation in that community. Suddenly, life is shattered as you know it and immediately there comes in that season of impact in those moments and days of impact, a great rising of, of energy. And that energy is both negative and positive. The energy incorporates rage and disbelief. It incorporates horror and also heroism as everyone in a community seeks to bring the goodness that they have, the hope that they have, the love that they have to bear, to try to address and to treat and to touch those whose lives have been shattered by trauma and public violence. Following that initial phase of heroism and devastation, we notice in congregations and in those immediately impacted by trauma that there is a, a sudden and steep falling off of energy, of hope, of faithfulness, and of understanding. The purpose that we have immediately following a trauma, which is to help and heal and be present, dissipates into an aimlessness, an aimlessness of wandering through the valley of the shadow. We experience this as a, as a deep and quick drop into a season that we have named disillusionment. This season may go from a month or two following a human-caused disaster and continue for maybe as many as two years as the congregation and the congregation's leadership and the larger community of which they are a part seek to make sense of what has happened seek to begin to incorporate into their life the shattering of the world they knew before and the faith they knew before and begin to decide how and whether they are able to enter into that place of darkness and trauma that is uh, the place of disillusionment and, and disaster and hopelessness. It's very difficult for people of faith to choose to enter willingly into this phase. And many faith leaders find that their instinct is to resist this phase and to preach hope, to preach the power of Christ to redeem all evil, to preach forgiveness, to talk about uh, the, the innate resilience of the Holy Spirit in the midst of a community. And while all of those things are true and all of those things are good, there is a time and a season. And the season of disillusionment is not the season for hope, forgiveness, and resolution. In fact, the very act of faithfulness in the season of disillusionment after a public violence event, or after a congregational trauma, or after the betrayal of a pastor or a youth leader, the very act of faithfulness in that moment is a willingness to enter into the darkness, a willingness to give voice and speech and power to the darkness of the world, a willingness to hold that space as a leader, a pastoral leader, and to make that space holy space where people can express anger, where people can raise the questions that this event has created in their experience of God's goodness. With Job, they may say, where is God? I have searched to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west, and I do not find God's presence. It is an act of faith and an act of great courage for a pastor and a congregation to enter together into that time of exploring the meaning of the absence of God, the perception of the absence of God, the perception that the covenant we have made with God, that we would be God's good people, we would serve faithfully in our community, we would do mission, we would preach the gospel, and therefore God would bless us with seasons of goodness and mercy, 
that somehow in this violent event, that covenant has been challenged and shattered. There is time in the future, perhaps way in the future, for the questions of resolution, the questions of forgiveness, the questions of goodness and mercy, and the acknowledgement of the new ways that God is with us to become present and to live in that congregation's life. But in the moments of dissolution and in the season that comes following violence, that time is not yet. To avoid entering into the darkness of grief, the anger, the rage, and the sense of abandonment is in a very real way to avoid the richness of how God is present to us in the midst of darkness. It is a difficult journey. It may feel like a dangerous journey. But for those of us whose faith is based in the crucified one, whose faith affirms we descend into hell with Christ and we dwell for three days in darkness, the act of being present to dwelling in darkness is indeed the deepest kind of faith and a faith that will inevitably someday in the future lead to resurrection.